but just expand uh, the labeling a little bit and use colors to make it more understandable. On Tuesday next week, we do the sheep heart dissection, so remember to wear closed shoes and bring goggles for that. I don't think you want sheep blood in your eyes. <laughs> These are frozen sheep hearts, so they're not preserved. I have to ask their goggles. <coughs> Can we use the ones that are like glasses, or do they have to be the form fitting? I'm okay with the side glasses. Okay. Um, all right, so. The first structure I'm going to draw is the myocardium. Remember what we call the muscle wall of the uterus? Myometrium. Okay, so myo is muscle, metrium is uterus. We're looking at the heart now, so it's cardium. Okay? Which one's the one I should use? Uh, it doesn't matter now. Does it matter? Do you know the code? This one, I want to know. It's 920. So, we look at the myocardium coming down the heart wall. This would be, say, the space or cavity, the atrium or the ventricle, right? Cardiac muscle. Which we'll look at next week. Not much histology to this unit. And then blood would be in this area here. Alright? So on the inner surface, we have a lining of simple squamous epithelia. So we'll put a legend over here. And what's beneath every epithelium? Loose irregular connective tissue or areolar tissue. And that is this lining right here. There might be some. Uh, a few adipocytes, but that tissue, that layer, is defined as endocardium. So again, in the uterus, we had simple corner <coughs> epithelium plus a thick layer, a changing thickness layer that was our endometrium. Okay, so this isn't as thick and it doesn't have glands, but it's lining the surface, the inner lining of the heart, covers the valves, um, continues into forming the lining of the blood vessels. So this is our endocardium, and that would be this surface here. All right, now we're ready to talk about the pericardium. So again, we have a simple squamous membrane forming a fluid-filled sac, all right? So here is the simple squamous epithelium. When it gets to a blood vessel off the top of the heart, it reverses on itself and comes back. And it's going to go completely around the heart. Okay? It's going to have serous fluid inside it. That's where the pericardial cavity is. And it's going to be attached to the myocardium. with loose, irregular connective tissue. So this is our pericardium, all right? Because it's attached to the organ, it's the visceral pericardium. Just like we had Perinetrium was really the visceral peritoneum attached to the uterus. So now we continue that loose connective tissue around as well. 
Now, if this was parietal pleura, it would be attached to the chest wall. If it was parietal peritoneum, it would be attached to the abdominal wall. And down the bottom, it might be attached to the, the diaphragm, but it's often not attached to any other surface. If we look at this view right here, here's that pericardium, here's the parietal pleura, and it's not attached to the sternum. Okay, So loose or regular connective tissue is kind of like a, a loosely woven strand, a bunch of cotton balls that are kind of pulled out and teased. That's not very strong, and it can easily shred. And so to provide a firmness to this layer, we add an additional layer. So this first layer is just is identified as the parietal peritoneum. But because it's just our serous membrane without anything else, it's identified as the parietal serous pericardium. So it's just like the blue, all right? Attached to the heart is visceral. Where it's not attached, it's parietal. But now, to provide additional toughness, so it doesn't shred as the heart's expanding, we add a layer of dense, irregular connective tissue to the outside. part of the parietal pericardium, but it's identified as the parietal fibrous because of all the collagen in it. known as the pericardial cavity. 
So the heart is free to expand within that without rubbing against the pericardium. Thank you. Okay, now, because of diseases <coughs> in the sheep, uh, I, the Federal Agricultural Department a couple of years ago ruled that they had to open up the pericardium and manually uh, check for the sheep hearts. We kind of got around that in a loophole because we weren't eating the sheep hearts. I haven't heard of faculty who take them home and cook them later, but I'm not sure if I ate meat, but anyway. Um, and so we were told we couldn't get hearts that had pericardia again. Uh, but then within a year or so, we started getting them again. And now they've closed that loophole, and they're not available. So we have a few left over from the, in the freezer from last orders. So I'll have one as a demo that you can observe and look at, even though yours won't have them. Okay? Yours will have just the visceral pericardium. Now we have plasticized hearts. These are real hearts that were perfused with plastic under a, in a pressure chamber. And so here they, you're seeing the visceral pericardium. Here is the membrane, actually, I like to put that on this side. Here is the fibrous pericardium. All right, my finger's in the pericardial cavity. This outer surface would be the fibrous layer of the parietal pericardium. And the inner surface would be lined with Simple squamous epithelium is part of the parietal serous pericardium. So this is continuous and going to be reflected onto the surface of the heart. All the way around as the sac and that fibrous layer is just added to this outer portion here. Okay? So the heart needs that lubrication as well. Um, I had a colleague when I was teaching back east who was the, well, he was of the chemistry department or something, but he still liked to think of himself as one of the boys. So every Friday afternoon, he'd go and play soccer with the college intramural team. And one Friday afternoon, he and another player ran into each other, chest to chest, and they both fell back and <coughs> picked themselves up after they caught their breath. And the next morning, when he woke up, he had chest pain. And his dad had had some heart problems. So, but you know, if I'm having a heart attack, and I start to exert myself, it'll hurt worse. So he got out of bed and he started doing jumping jacks. Uh, and it didn't hurt any worse. It still hurt, but it didn't hurt any worse. So I'll run up and down my stairs. If I'm having a heart attack, it'll hurt worse. So he ran up and down the stairs. And then he went outside and ran up and down the hill outside his house. And we're like, are you trying to kill yourself? But anyway, so it still kept hurting, but it wasn't worse. So he had a friend drive him to the hospital. What had happened when he and another player hit was the compression on his chest had rubbed, pushed the chest, the sternum in, and rubbed the two surfaces together. All right, so the inner simple squamous of this had rubbed against here, it rubbed them off, and an inflammatory reaction had started and allowed fluid to seep in, pericarditis. And it, that's why his chest hurt with each beat of the heart. They gave him antibiotics to make sure there wasn't an infection. It started, sent him home, and said the next time you have chest pain, just come see us. Don't <laughs> run around. <laughs> Where did the blood go? Into, into the pericardial cavity. Okay? Which brings us to another term known as cardiac company. You should have both of these terms in your lecture notes. Down at the bottom of try the next page. Page 10. Okay. So, uh, pericarditis is just an inflammation of the lining of the pericardial cavity. Cardiac tamponade is what occurs when a greater amount of fluid, greater amount over normal, of fluid gathers in the pericardial cavity. So, with the inflammatory reaction, uh, inflammation, fluid seeping in from that loose connective tissue, we've been a start of cardiac tamponade. Um, the naturalist from Australia, what was his name? Not Steve. What was it Steve? Steve Irwin. Or was it Irwin? Um, I think it's Steve Martin, that was so wrong. Uh, was impaled by a stingray um, stinger and reflexively pulled it out of his heart. Now he might not have lived anyway, but that didn't help because that just opened up the whole 
and the blood poured out of his heart into the pericardial cavity and probably his chest cavity. A few months later, a very similar thing happened outside of the water. Uh, grandfather had taken his granddaughter and a friend out off the Florida coast in a fishing boat, and a stingray landed in their boat. And same thing, he got impaled by the stinger, but he left it in and got back to shore. All right, so uh, a knife um, going through the chest wall and penetrating the pericardial sac can let blood into the pericardial cavity. A nail from a roofing you know, gun or whatever, you don't want to pull those out because that's helping to plug the hole. There was a really sad case um, over near Davis, uh, before I, I heard about when I started working at the hospital there, and it had happened prior to that, where a young woman who was six months pregnant had come in with pneumonia, and they started a, a subclavian line on her, which is where they put a large bore needle under the collarbone into the subclavian vein to add fluid, and hooked it up to an IV. Well, she kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse, and finally they took x-rays and took chest x-rays and the needle had been pushed all the way through into the pericardial sac and all the IV fluid instead of going into her blood supply it was going into the closed space of the pericardial sac. So as that fills up with fluid, what's happening to the room that the heart has to fill up with blood? It's getting less and less, okay? Now the heart needs to maintain blood flow and blood pressure so when it can pump out less, and we'll talk about this next week, what happens, less volume, what happens to rate? It starts to go faster and faster because it's trying to make up. If I have to empty um, a five gallon bucket in two minutes, all right, and I have a quart container to do so, I don't have to do it as many times. But if my container that I'm emptying it has been re reduced to a quarter cup, I'm gonna have to do that more often, okay? <laughs> So with each pump, the heart is being able to pump less volume to keep up with the same amount of output over a minute. It's going to have to do it more often. So that's why you hear about a weak pulse, but very rapid, is because the pressure is low because the volume with each contraction is low. And to try to maintain the same volume over the same amount of time, it has to do it more often. So we have a thready, rapid, thready pulse. Heart rate is rapid because each contraction is smaller volume and they're trying to, trying to maintain that overall volume. Okay, so the heart situated in its cavity is more to the left than it is center line. The sternum, right in position here, would be kind of over this place right here, heart-wise. So we see that apparently affects the development of the lungs. The left lung has only two lobes. Or right lung has three, and the, the number of valves and the atrioventricular valves. The um, right valve has three, the left atrioventricular valve has only two. So there's a little bit more um, of a change in that aspect of it. The histology that you're gonna have to deal with is just the myocardium, and we'll look at that next week. The epicardium is thicker than the endocardium. This is cardiac muscle right here, so this would be the thickness of the endocardium. The ventricle or atrium would be here with the simple squamous epithelium. Here is the myocardium, and that's how thick the um, epicardium is. Now I'm using epicardium. Epicardium is a short way of saying visceral pericardium. So either term is available to you, okay? All right, let's stop there. It's a natural place to take a break. So just a short 10 minute break, um, and then we'll pick up the chambers of the heart, okay? Follow the blood flow through the heart. Uh, for easy counting, make it 20 up. All right, so 12 minutes back at 20 out.
I was like, am I just scrap one out of my car? This is 
solid. So this is yeah, that's that's bone and muscle. Yeah. Alright, so yeah, that's the smoke cavity and that's the visceral cord between the parietal. Attached to the lung itself. Attached to the lung itself. So if we so if we were to draw that larger, it would be the lung. It's gonna be visceral pleura. Thank you. 